Chapter 2, Meeting Ethical and Legal Responsibilities. Um, this chapter focuses on those ethics. Remember, those are the, the um, personally enforced or maybe enforced within your paper or organization. They are not legally enforced, um, meaning you won't go to jail if you violate your ethics. You might lose your job, okay? Um, uh, but uh, you know there really won't be any uh, legal ramifications unless you go, you know, slandering, libeling people, and um, you know, obviously, then that you could have legal fallout. But that's usually just a, a fine. I, I don't believe jail time is a typical. Um, I can't remember ever seeing anyone go to jail for slander, or libel. It's usually just monetary damages. Uh, what the the, uh, the the individual seeks. Um, Functions of a journalist. These are the, the, the purpose, um, purposes rather for a journalist to exist. The first is that political function. Think about this, folks. Come uh, election year, every couple years for Senate, Congress, or political uh, stateside, or, or um, uh, president, if we didn't have the journalists to convey what their agendas are, would you know who to vote for? Well, I like I guess I like that person's hair better than this one, or she's more attractive than that one, or what? I mean, you would have to break it down to that if you knew nothing about them. And so one of the roles of the journalist is to educate us. It's to inform us about uh, these candidates. It's to let us know what's going on in Congress, what bill is being argued, you know, what, um, how so-and-so voted. We need to know that so that we can tell our constituents, uh, we're the constituents, we can tell our political people that we want you to go in different areas and vote blah, 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 and represent us well. And so it opens up that, that dialogue. It educates us. Without the, the, the journalists covering, we would be lost, and we wouldn't know unless we were out there covering it for ourselves. Um, and that's uh, the, the, they carry the obligation of providing the audience with information upon which to base political decisions. Here, I like this phrase. They're the watchdog of the government. Think about if there was no watchdog and they could do whatever they want and get away with whatever they want. I'm sure they're all upstanding citizens and wouldn't do anything, anything bad. I mean, we're talking politicians. Can you imagine if no one was watching over their shoulder, what they could slip through? Those of you that have had government, have you talked about uh, pork? Pork government? How with these bills, so-and-so can start sliding in things to help their constituents back home, put a new bridge, get a couple million dollars of this $800 million bill. I, I need 200 of that earmarked for, for, my, for my little Ponder Town project that I want, okay? And then I'll vote on it. That's called pork, and so they put pork in things. Um, imagine some of the things that would be put through, and that stuff goes through now, there's nothing illegal about it, but imagine how big it could get if there was no watchdog. And so it's, it's such a vital, vital importance, um, and some might say one of the most important, if not the most important, um, role of the journalist. Um, they cover in detail the activities, they watch for a scandal and wrongdoing. They scrutinize budgets to make sure that our tax dollars aren't being wasted. And so they keep tabs on all that and they hold them accountable. Um, and they educate us on it so we can hold them accountable. Um, and this is, they call it that this is the foremost of the press's responsibilities, word for word, word from the book. Um, and so they believe it is. And like I said, I believe this is probably one of the most just because of the power that our politicians wield we need to be educated as to what's going on. Um, the next function, uh, the economic function, the public needs information about products, goods, and services in addition to events. Business, industrial, and agriculture news conveys this information. Well, that kind of sounds like advertising, and it says here, but so does advertising. Um, learning about oil prices going up, going down, learning about um, you know, how the, the weather, the unseasonably hot weather has impacted, maybe drought caused damage crops, maybe, you know, hurricanes, what does that do to the, to the, uh, the, the flood basin of certain communities? Um, but it, it, it reports all of these things so that we know and we can live our lives and be updated with what truly is uh, going on. Um, 
The sentry function, okay, this, I like this phrase, the press watches society's horizons. What's coming, okay? What's coming, if you've ever been out on the open water on the beach and you can't see the other side uh, of the water, it just kind of curves out. But watch that horizon, eventually something might come over it. So these people look to the future, okay, look down the road at what potentially is, is coming. Um, uh, da, 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 da. The press must report not only what is happening today, but what is likely to happen because that might influence p policy. It might. Uh, we don't want to be surprised. Um, some of the earliest uh, 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 public knowledge about um, the ozone layer, um, the greenhouse effect, you know, the polar ice caps melting. Some of the earliest uh, public information that came about was through the press. Well, we've had Congress talking about this, and all, yeah, but some of the earliest was through the media. Um, the record-keeping function, the mass media should reflect an accurate record of local, national, and world news. Consumers need to know many basic things, including the data often found tucked away in the back of the paper. And so it's their, op their job to convey data, information, not just stories and opinions and what's going on, but we need to know maybe facts, okay? Data on whatever, uh, data on a stock market maybe. Data on how much your stocks are going up, going down. Um, sports, anybody look at the sports page? Okay, before the internet, and if your game wasn't on TV, you would have to wait till the next morning. Did so-and-so, did they win, did they win? Look through the paper, they won, awesome. Awesome, yeah, I went to bed or I couldn't catch the game. And so you learn, okay, now with technology, um, the press, you know, with Twitter, um, other sites at Facebook, but uh, online websites, mobile apps, notifications, push notifications, all that, you were able to find out you know, data and find out all of this information. So that's one of the, uh, one of the aspects. Um, mass media consumers need diversion as well as information. They need to be entertained. There needs to be an entertainment function. If you've ever seen uh, on TV, you know, Entertainment Tonight, Inside Edition, you know, all these different shows, um, they're not necessarily trying to push themselves off as we are newsworthy. Even though they might say, oh, we have a world exclusive interview, blah, blah, blah. They're there to entertain us, okay? Magazines are there to entertain you. Sports Illustrated, they're there to entertain you. However, they have some very in-depth articles to educate you about uh, scandals. Okay, there's a big scandal with uh, Oklahoma State football that's gonna break in the next few days. Um, I don't know if anybody saw that teaser on ESPN the last couple of days. Um, you know, all of the, the uh, Alex Rodriguez steroids, you know, a lot of that stuff, the Ryan Braun steroids, McGuire steroids, all that stuff, a lot of it was broken through the press and through some investigative journalists. Um, and uh, so, I mean, once again, that, that's more along the line of uh, some of these other functions, but yet, overall, these magazines can entertain. And, and we look to the press uh, for entertainment from time to time. Social function. Um, you know, passing along the news created a social situation in which people discuss the world. Um, so think about back in the old days, maybe you lived, uh, think Little House on the Prairie, where you might see your neighbor once every month while you're out working the fields. Your property butts up against them and you have a fence, and maybe you stop there and, and you chat. And that would be your chance to pass along news and information. And so and so, well, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, down in that county. Well, really, that's quite amazing. I know, it's pretty amazing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but it provides that, that conversation. It provides that news. Okay, if you've ever heard about the water cooler at work, okay, you ever heard that cliche, so and so, oh boy, they were talking about that at the water cooler today. Because, or nowadays, might be the coffee pot. People go to get their drinks, get their, their coffee, and they just, See that game last night? An unbelievable fourth and three, and they went for it. Oh my gosh, what were they thinking? Yeah, yeah. Hey, you see that VMAs the other night? Wow, was she nuts? I know. And so news provides that social gathering, that social interaction, um, and that's the importance of, uh, you know, it's important for the press to uh, provide that outlet. Um, the marketplace function provides a form in which all sorts of ideas are presented. It becomes the marketplace of ideas. 
if the audience is concerned about the environment and conveys this concern through the press, through the press, perhaps something will get done. So this is an opportunity for maybe the public to get some news uh, to cover whatever they think is newsworthy, and if the press can grab onto it and they can set that out there, then maybe some decision makers. Oh wow, look at that! It spread like a wildfire. Now people are talking about it. Oh my goodness! And it just needed to get going. Um, and so we can see that uh, happening in this particular function. And really the last one is the agenda setting function. Uh, although journalists don't tell us what to think, they do tell us what to think about. This is really an important one as well. Maybe not as important as that other stuff, but some of the earliest things um, that, that I heard, I, I think I gave this example the other day in this class, one of my classes. Um, Saddam Hussein had some sons who weren't very good. One's name was Uday. Anybody remember him about that? I think I believe it's U-D-A-Y. I remember reading an article in Maxim Magazine about it years ago, talking about in great detail about all of these bad things that he's done and people that he's killed and how he's kind of the ringleader of this little gang, blah, 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 blah. And so I learned a lot about that. And then a couple years later, this was news all of a sudden, and there was Nightline and you know, uh, uh, the 6.30 national news was talking about it. I'm like, I remember reading about They're talking about the same stuff. And so through the press, they're able to bring up, you should really see the problem going on right now. And there, it gets public exposure. It just has to pick up speed. It's kind of like if something trends, okay, on Twitter or Facebook or whatever, it's got to start off somewhere. It starts off really slow. So-and-so shares it, so-and-so -so tags it, and then it just grows exponentially. One person has to post that initially. One person posts it, I have 100 friends, they all like it, 20 of them repost it. Wow, now 20 people have posted. All their 100 friends, can you see how exponentially it can grow? And so by the time you hear about it, by the time you've heard about it, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions have, have done it. You see this uh, recently, this twerking video that went viral, girl that set herself on fire. Oh, yeah. It's pretty funny. That was hilarious. Yeah, it, it just came out yesterday that it was a hoax and Jimmy Kimmel set it up, which she didn't, you didn't see her get lit on fire on camera, it happened off camera. Those trick shot videos where you see balls getting thrown from wherever, and you can tell if it's fake or not, usually if the ball leaves the frame, okay, sometimes because computer generated, things like that. Um, but anyway, so uh, this video had to start off somewhere, and I saw it on CNN, that's where I saw it. And then later on that night, I saw Yahoo tagged it on their front page, and I saw other people on Facebook posting. It started off somewhere where it started to grow and grow and grow. Um, I'm kind of getting off topic, but I just want to show you that it just starts small and goes from there. And that's one of the journalist's role, is to help us uh, educate us on what to think about. Okay? They're trying not necessarily to, to sway you, some might, but overall, we just, the, we journalists want to educate you and tell you what you need to think about. So hopefully if it's important, you can grasp onto it and you can spread the word. Maybe at the water cooler. Or with your congressman. And then eventually it can pick up steam and make big time news. Um, the media have the power to determine what we talk about as individuals and address as a nation. If the media place environmental issues on the agenda, people will begin to pay more attention to those topics. Do you remember the swine flu aspect a couple years ago, outbreak? There really weren't that many people that were affected. But we had a four hour line at the clinic in order to get our kids vaccinated because everybody was worried about swine flu. More people die of regular flu than swine flu. There were more confirmed cases of regular flu than swine flu. Where do you think that paranoia was spread through? The media. If they didn't put it in the, in the news about, oh, one more was found, two more were found here, I'm thinking, okay, fine. And again, I'm not a, I'm not a, a physician, so maybe it was a bigger deal than what, I, what I'm giving it credit for. But the point is, if the news hadn't perpetuated that, people wouldn't have really known about it, and people wouldn't have sat four hours on the side street waiting to get their, their shot for their kids. Um, and so if they want to talk about this as important, it gives a lot of uh, credibility to it, and they, they have some power. They have some power. Um, so I know that went on a little long, but uh, there are a lot of functions, and knowing those and examples of each one would be very, very helpful. 
Um, the ethics of journalism, and this will go hand in hand with what we show in a little bit. Um, credibility, I want to talk about accuracy, objectivity, and then there's a couple others. I mean, these se should seem very basic to you. Okay, overall, be honest and you'll be fine. Be honest. Credibility is the ability to be believed and trusted. And as news, which ultimately needs to make money, they need the viewers, they need the subscribers to their paper or magazine so that they are able to sell more advertising, jack the rates on their advertising. You ever wonder why the Super Bowl ads cost $3 million for 30 seconds? Because 100 million people are going to be watching. And so they can charge that much and people will pay it because they know that they are getting the eyeballs watching. You're not going to sell $3 million ad for the 6 o'clock news, 6 a.m. news. You see the difference? And so uh, they, their credibility is important because if you're not coming to, to my site to find out the news, if you're going to some other site, I lost a set of eyeballs. I lost a visitor, and so that's going to hurt my bottom line with advertisers, and that's not good. They take credibility so serious. Seriously, if somebody lies about a story, makes something up, doctors a picture, and gets caught, they're fired instantly. It doesn't matter how long they've been there. Because now, once that's made public, we as the paper, or whatever institution, we have to build up that credibility again. There was a photographer a few years back who took a picture uh, after one of our bombings in Afghanistan, and it was in the daylight, a horizon of uh, some city, and you could see smoke coming up. That was it, okay? Well, what this photographer did, he took the picture and then in Photoshop or whatever um, uh, editing software he used, he made the smoke darker so that it was, wow, look at that darkness. So he manipulated it and that's not reporting exactly what is there. He's trying to influence what people's views are. Um, have you heard of O.J. Simpson? Yeah, okay, back in the early 90s, he was uh, tried for murder of his wife and her boyfriend, and he was acquitted, but a lot, then the, everybody went nuts about it. Still, people are pretty upset about it. There were two magazines. I'm gonna have to find these. I'm pretty sure it was Time and Newsweek. Let's just go with that. I really think that those were the two. They each put his mugshot on, okay? One magazine made him look really black and dark. The other made him look really light and not white skin, not, not like Michael Jackson's condition, but they made him look lighter. Boy, that caused a lot of controversy. Okay, and I can't I can't remember if that was after after it happened, like after the, the the ruling, or if it was. I bet it was towards the beginning and, and during. But they were representing him in differently on how he looks. What what are they trying to say? They are not portraying him in the exact light. I'll have some examples I'll share with you in the next few days of um, choices that, that journalists make that they probably wish they had. We'll watch a movie down the road called Shattered Glass uh, about a young person, very, very popular writer for a New York uh, news magazine. And uh, he was convicted, not convicted like a crime, but he was caught fabricating, making up his stories. And it was a, that's bad. Okay, that's bad. There was a gentleman in New York called Jason Blair who made up these people that he interviewed. They never existed. Everything else might have been fine, but he made up these quotes to drop in. Gone, just like that. You think those people are gonna get hired at another newspaper ever again? They could have a string of Pulitzer Prizes. Journal Gazette hires Jason Blair, five-time Pulitzer Prize. He didn't win five. Five-time Pulitzer Prize winner, blah, blah, blah. People will be like, yeah, but isn't he the guy that made stuff up? That credibility is so important. Once it's gone in news, it's gone. And so that's why you can't make stuff up, uh, amongst other things. Um, it's the journalist's ethics that provide the daily working guidelines for deciding what gets into print or onto the airwaves. The ethical, responsible journalist tries to serve the audience's best interest. You want your news put out there. You want to be taken seriously, all of that. You want to have the scoop and be the first one to report. But you got to make sure that you're not violating certain personal ethics, compromising your beliefs is a good way of saying it, or 
your representation of, uh, you are a representative of the, the company, the paper, whatever. So you don't want to violate them or else you're gone. Um, so be careful there. A journalist who violates the law, of course, faces the same penalty as any other citizen. So if you violate the law, you don't go, well, I was doing a news story, so I can, I can do what I can speed, I can whatever, I can be an accessory to a crime because it's a good story. Rate of a speech. Um, no. Okay. Not at all. Um, so keep that in mind. The framers of the Constitution believed a free press, even though occasionally irresponsible, is vastly preferred to a government controlled press. Remember when we talked about those early, remember the newspaper, the public occurrences, the first paper? How many editions did it have? How many issues? Do you remember? It was shut down by the British because they didn't like what they said. So they were, you know, then afterwards they were able, not the occurrences, but other papers were allowed to run, okay, by authority of the British government. So they would look over and make sure what you were putting in is fine, all of that. Um, and the Constitution was like, you know what, I don't want that at all. So even if our press is a little irresponsible or gets it wrong from time to time, I would rather have that than what we have had up till now. And so while they're in support of you know, a, a fallible press, it's hopeful that everybody takes responsibility for their actions and they have a very strong uh, moral and ethical code. So uh, keep that in mind. Um, Talking about accuracy, the phrase to remember regarding accuracy of stuff you're focusing on, close doesn't count. Okay, there's no such thing as a small error. If you say 51 senators are going to vote on this and support, blah, 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 and you just made that number up, or even if you're off one or two, that's significant because 51 is the deciding number in the Senate to pass something. So if it's really 49, it comes out later that it's 49. You said 51. What's going? Well, I, I thought it'd be around 51. I was kind of guessing, but it was an educator. I was close. Yeah, but the whole story's wrong now. I had somebody on newspaper years ago that was doing a a preview of the uh, let's say basketball season, and uh, their story was uh, the upcoming season. You know, they're building off last year's. Um, they used the term something like uh, almost uh, seven victories last year. Wait a minute, they had almost seven? Well, how many did they have? Well, I don't know if I did seven. You're telling me they had seven? No, almost seven. Is that five? No. Right. Maybe I should just put, maybe I should put less than 10. Why don't you just say how many they had? Be specific. Okay, be specific. Somebody sets a sports record, don't you want to know specifically what the record is? I would think so. When we see tragedies, not that you look for the number dead or the casualties, but doesn't that add a little bit more substance to the story? The whole uh, Syria chemical warfare, all of that stuff. Did any of you see the pictures or video of the, the devastation? the death of the kids and the, the people and the innocents and all of that. Knowing the number of people, I mean, one person dead by chemical was horrible. A thousand, fifteen hundred, seventeen hundred, whatever, that's horrible. But giving that number, it makes a lot. And today being September 11th, can you guys remember what you were doing when that stuff happened? You probably don't remember. You probably remember maybe the teacher talking about it briefly. Um, you know, having that number of firefighters or people in the building or on the plane, it, it adds something. You can't go, well, there were about a little more than 300 fire, no, 343. Be definitive about it. And so accuracy is important. And again, don't make stuff up. Don't ever make stuff up. Go by that code um, and you should be fine. Um, Objectivity, this is part of, uh, that's important. I spoke to you about it before in the interviewing. You need to be objective. It's the state of mind that journalists acquire to make them fair, neutral observers of events and issues. And again, there's that word neutral. Think of it in a car. If you are in neutral, you are not moving. Unless you're on a hill. But you're not moving, forward or backwards. If you need to go forward, you're in support of something, you're going forward. You put it in reverse and move backwards, if you are against something. As a writer, you need to be stuck, firmly in neutral. Now, 
if you are an editorial writer, you have a blog, you have a column that shows up on the opinion page, are you allowed to have an opinion then? I hope everybody's saying yes and this makes sense. If you are running a news story on the front page of a paper, should you have opinion in it? No. And this sounds harsh, but I, editor, I, audience, subscriber, I don't care what you think. I don't care what your opinion is. If I want your opinion, I'll look on the opinion page to see what you have to say. I'll go to your blog knowing this is an opinion and I'll read it. I don't want to see your opinion covering broadcast. You're a Democrat covering a Republican sponsored bill. I don't care that you're a Democrat. For so long, people thought I don't care is such a harsh statement. I'm just saying I don't, I don't care that you're a Democrat. I want to know about the Republican. I want an unbiased neutral viewpoint on this Republican bill that's being sponsored. Can you do that? Can you do that? If not, I'm going to another station. Over time, you would probably start to see a pattern, and over time, the business aspect of it is going to notice, and you're going to have a problem. So make sure that you stay neutral. Do not permit your personal feelings, your likes or dislikes, to color the news. There's always a place for it, but know your role. Know your role and know your responsibility. Um, so keeping uh, neutral and fair and balanced. If you're showing two sides of an argument, show two sides. Don't just cover one side. Here, look, we've got a scale. Don't just show one side because this side gets hosed. Well, I gave them one quote. You gave 10 quotes to the opposition. If you're going to give five, Give four or five for the other so that it balances. You need to be fair. You need to be objective. You need to be neutral. Remember those words. And if you don't know what those words mean, okay, or mean rather, you're going to be in trouble. So make sure you ask questions and find out what those three mean. Huge. That's ethics in a nutshell. As a writer, your decision making, am I being fair? Am I being neutral, impartial, all that balanced? Good. I'm fine. And you usually are. And so after a while, it's just it's common, common knowledge. Um, page 38, these are other principles. Some of these are basic. Basic, and it should be like, well, duh, obviously. A good taste. Avoid sensationalism, which usually means, you know, for ratings or profits. Don't just throw stuff out there. Don't go for that screaming headline, okay? Stay away from that. Have good taste. Stay away from things like sexually explicit material. Well, it'll sell, and they'll talk about it. Yeah, but this is the New York Times. All the news that's fit to be printed, right? So don't, we don't want to flash this up here. But what if it's a scandal? If it's Bill Clinton with Monica Lewinsky, you guys remember that? It's a little bit before you, but maybe you know I've been through your history class. These things are newsworthy now, and we, that's fine. Don't just throw stuff up there. And that's what good taste is. You make the good choices. Okay, if there was a, every once in a while, and this is graphic, there's usually a, a beheading of somebody in the Middle East, some hostage. Have you ever heard of this happening? There's one of them. It was like, it was a sign, actually. But... Sometimes, they're, now with video and phones, they're recording it, and things are leaking online. Should we take a picture of still in mid shot so that we can put that on? No. Can we report the story? If it's news one? Yes. Do you understand good taste? Okay. And again, extreme examples help to help to uh, to, to make my point. Um, fairness to all. Okay. Being fair to everyone, fair treatment, everyone in your audience. You don't want to write a sexist type story. Okay. You, you, well, you just don't. You want to keep everything balanced neutral, you don't want to slam one particular slide, that type of thing, or one particular race or, or nationality or whatever. Uh, plagiarism, don't do it. That make common sense to you guys? And it should now even more so based on what I told you about credibility. If you're caught plagiarizing, firing is the least of your worries because you'll never get hired again to do what you were doing. And so keep that in mind. Um, attribution, this is a big word that generally means make sure you cite your sources. Who said it? If you don't tell us, then it was you who said it. 
we, we're not talking just direct quotes. We're talking indirect. Even if you put their idea in your own words, is it your idea? No. This is the key. So however you need to remember this. If the idea is someone else's other than yours, you need to cite it. You need to cite it. Just like in any paper you write. If it's not your idea, you need to cite where that idea came from. And direct quotes are usually a great way to demonstrate that. Direct quotes, as we said earlier in interviewing, it's wonderful, it adds a lot of color, it adds personality, and it adds a face to, to the writing. So those are all, all great examples of, uh, of the ethics and the choices that people should make. Good, let's just take a quick look at the PowerPoint, and you can look up here on the, the screen. Um, again, this is another exposure into it. What are ethics? They're a set of principles or code, moral, moral conduct, okay? Um, the study of ethics is learning to justify our ethical choices based upon sound ethical precepts. So um, decisions, standards that are set by the publication, maybe by years and years of you working, you've made your own codes, and so keep that in mind. Um, usually, the, sometimes, I guess, oftentimes there are no right answers when presented with an ethical dilemma. We're just like, should I do this or shouldn't I? If you are ever struggling, struggling, talk to other people. Bring in other individuals. Bring in peers. We're all writers here. Let's, what would you do? It adds a lot, but I just, I don't know. Ultimately, go to the person who's the decision maker, your editor, editor in chief. Let them help with the call. Do you see how that's covering your bases and protecting you? So if you're struggling, and it's just like, oh, I just, this is right on the fence. It could, I can make an argument either way. I really want to do it, but I really, I'm just not sure. And so it might, it, it might be a hard decision. And ultimately, you might scrap the idea. Ultimately, you might print it. But get some other feedback in there, and things should, uh, should be good. But the key here is that you need to be able to justify, explain. Okay, you didn't do it. Why? I'm your editor-in-chief. Why? We worked for four months on this story, and because of this one quote, we're not running it? I think it's fine. Why, why aren't we? And you have to be able to verbalize it back. Oh, okay. Well, all right. Good choice. I understand. I understand. You know, one of those type of things. You have to be able to, for or against it, be able to justify it. That's key. Okay? Um, these are the values that uh, they should take from granted for the media. Okay, everybody has different values. Everyone, looking at this list, culture, family, peers, probably everyone in this in this room or watching the video. No one is probably completely identical to the person next to you or to friends. I'm sure there are some some differences, and so with that, okay, we have all of these things that we just talked about earlier from the book, we have to be respectful of those individuals. That's why we don't want to offend or insult and all that. You have to stay balanced, neutral, and everything else. And so that's what these last few slides really focus on. You know, balance, keeping that scale right there. Does it have to be exactly, I had 10 quotes on a big story, so I need five quotes of each within reason, folks. The same amount of ink, the same amount of support, whatever that looks like in your situation, it needs to be balanced. All right, um, so keep that in mind. Uh, being objective, we talked about in great detail, so hopefully this is reinforcing what being objective means, especially if you were on the fence about it. Um, the ability to make fair, neutral observations about people and events, and then credibility. It's to be believed, okay, to be believable, and so that is the key, because once that's gone, it's gone. Again, we have the bullet points for our accuracy and what the details of that involve. You know, you don't want to just be, ah, I'm in the ballpark. No, it needs to be this. And we use that Congress vote. It needs to be how much money is being set aside for us. Oh, I don't know, maybe 10 million, I don't know. No, how much is it really? Okay, 52 million. Okay, that's a big difference, okay? Even if it would have been 11 million, well, it's close, right? One million dollars, that's a lot to us, right? That's a lot to me. Now to Congress on the grand scheme of things, when they're talking billions and hundreds of millions, is one million really much? No, but to us, the people that matter, the constituents, 
It could. So we need to know that. You know, we talk about taste and decency, so understanding, uh, you know, to, to keep yourself uh, uh, stare clear away from this. Uh, honesty, always tell the truth. Conflict of interest is something we didn't talk too much about yet, but I wanted to. Um, you really want to stay away from something if you have an interest in that. Um, if you are a stockholder of some company, as a news reporter, you probably want to stay clear of doing a profile piece on the, you know, the principal owner of that and giving them airwaves and advertising. <coughs> you kind of see why? Conflict of interest? If you are uh, on the student paper and you're on the basketball team or in the band, and would it be a great idea to send you to do the story on those different sports or band? No. Well, why not? Because that person, they really know what questions to ask. And I mean, yeah, yeah, here's the thing, guys. I would read this story and be like, Jason wrote this story. Jason's in the band. So Jason's just talking to his friends. And this isn't very credible anymore. Wait a minute, he's the drum major. Why can't he talk to some? Yeah, but I don't know if this is going to be really balanced or I can't take his word for it anymore. Never interview your friends. Never interview relatives. That's a conflict of interest. Okay? It's a conflict of interest. And so this is, I think this is an obvious one, but it's one especially when you get crunched with a deadline and you have to find something. And I could go there, ah, oh, but I, it's a conflict of interest. I, I shouldn't do that. So you're, you're in the student council and you're going to write a story on student council activities, you prob or they're coming to you for a quote on it, like, oh, I'm on the paper and we're doing a story on student council, I probably, I probably should abstain and not do anything with that. And so you really have to, 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 to think about this. Can you ever be connected to the, to the story? If so, you probably should abstain and get away from it. So um, that's definitely, uh, definitely <coughs> one. If you look at the very last one here, uh, truth has been, excuse me, truth has been called the first principle of journalist, journalism. Without it, there is nothing. That's very similar to what we said in the First Amendment, okay? The truth protects you. The truth here, if you are truthful, you are protected, okay? And typically, you're safe. Now, obviously, you need to go back through these steps. Good taste. Should I put it out there? Should we put the picture there? You need to go through those questions and always, always talk to your peers and your higher ups and bring them in on the decision making process. They might actually think, you might think, well, that will make me look weak. No, it'll make you look like you want to cover yourself and cover the paper or internet or whatever. And they probably appreciate that because you think they want to have that slide through under their nose and then they get a, you know, a big old, big old upheaval from the public? Probably not, because then it's a bigger problem. They'll take five minutes to deal with it now, so they don't have to spend eight hours dealing with it later. Um, so keep that, keep that in mind. Ethics of objectivity, being neutral, fair, impartial, balanced, all of those key words. Again, this stuff should seem pretty basic and familiar, but in the heat of action and against deadlines, you might start to want to compromise a little bit. And then that's a slippery slope. Well, I did it one time, so I go, it's kind of like cheating. You try to cheat once, you might get away with it, and then you're more likely to cheat again, maybe on a bigger scale. Yeah, but I promise, someday you'll, you'll get caught. And then will it be worth it? In the grand scheme of this, you might get away with it for a while, but eventually no one will want to hire you, or you'll get fired, and then you'll never get hired, and so you just got caught cheating. So keep that in mind, ethical choices, individual, personal beliefs, okay? And those can be created and molded by where you work.